Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Rachel Toombs. I'm the Director of Grassroots and Community Growth here at America's Future Foundation. We at AF want to empower millennials and Gen Zers by making them uh, lifelong learners and lovers of liberty through education, um, professional opportunities, training, and connection to other people who share our values. Tonight, we're going to be talking about a really, really important topic, no matter who you are, no matter where you are on the political spectrum, reopening, but from a different perspective as far as communicating how you feel about reopening. We're seeing a lot of conflict uh, within certain circles, actually, I think most circles, over whether or not we should reopen. Um, and really, we want the, the dialogue to be constructive. So I feel like this is a very timely event and we have two wonderful speakers. If this event is something that you enjoy, we have 22 chapters all over the country. They are also hosting monthly events remotely for now um, until it is safe to do so in person again. But feel free to reach out uh, to me. I'll put my contact information in the chat box at the end of this event. You can also go on americasfuture.org and uh, check out all the content and past events that we have on there too. We also have a blog on there. We talk a lot about uh, reopening and other relevant topics to the crisis and to reopening. Everything from how to manage your finances and how to plan for the future, how to get a job during the crisis, to events just like this on communicating as well as policy um, and other experts on the topic. So feel free to check that out. Now, before I introduce our first speaker, I'm gonna ask you a question and I want you to think really um, thoughtfully, not to be redundant, but I want you to be really thoughtful about your response. And you can put your response in the chat box. So the question that I want to ask you is who in your life do you disagree with on reopening? I'll say that one more time. Who in your life do you disagree with on reopening? And you can go ahead and put that in the chat box. Okay, parents, sure. Okay, a few friends that are immune compromised. All right, coworkers. Okay, sister, employees, coworkers, great. Husband, oh, that's a tough one, Carol. Yep. <laughs> oh, okay. Thank you, Jen, for sharing that. All right, so as our speaker is uh, giving his presentation and talking through some great information about why people are viewing reopening the way that they are, I want you to think about the people in your life that you disagree with and try to put yourself in their shoes and maybe try to understand where they're coming from and why they would believe the way that they believe that's so different from yours. Um, and now, without further ado, I would love to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Luke Conway. Let me just pull this up real quick. I apologize. Um, yes, so Dr. Luke Conway, he's a professor of psychology at the University of Montana, and he's a fellow at the Society of Experimental Social Psychology. His primary research interests actually revolve around psychology of politics and culture. So perfect fit for this topic. He's the author of over 75 articles, commentaries, and book chapters in these areas. And his work has been featured in major media outlets, such as the Washington Post, New York Times, US Today, and BBC Radio. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Luke Conway. Luke, feel free to go ahead and take it away. Thank you very much, Rachel. Appreciate that. So y'all are hearing me, I'm assuming. You can hear me? Okay, great. And you're seeing my screen? Okay, great. Just double checking. So um, that that is my daughter, Autumn. Um, she's beautiful, as you can see. When she was five, 
one of our favorite activities was to play flag football or a version of flag football in our backyard. Um, and one of Autumn's favorite parts of that was she really enjoyed creating fictitious teams. So she's five. She enjoyed creating fictitious team names and designing like cheers around those team names um, as a part of learning the finer art of smack talk. Well, one day the, she generated this name, which was Funky Monkey University for her team. Now I'm a parent, she's five. We are here in Missoula. By the way, yay, shout out to Corvallis. I saw, okay, we're practically neighbors here in Montana, even though Corvallis is, you know, an hour away. So, um, so, so, we're, so we're here in Missoula in our backyard. We're very close quarters with our neighbors so they can hear what we're saying in our backyard. We're playing, they can watch us. And I'm as a parent thinking there's about a billion ways that Funky Monkey University can go horribly wrong. The actual outcome was way worse than I ever would have thought. So here's what she did. She abbreviated, her cheer abbreviated Funky Monkey University, except she misabbreviated the middle letter as F and put a huge pause in between the first and second letters. So she was, my five-year-old daughter was shouting to the neighborhood this, F, F you, F, F you, like super loud. And I could just feel the people around me, like all of my neighbors, like, you know, awesome parenting, great job. Now, my daughter is a beautiful person, and she would never intentionally yell gross obscenities at our neighbors, but this is a parable for how I think we feel a lot, how I feel a lot these days. It seems like we're all across some fence shouting at each other about whether or not we want to open or close, or a bunch of other things about this divide. In fact, we're arguing over things we hadn't even thought about. We're never on our radar six months ago. Should we wear a mask or not? That's a big deal in the circles that I travel in, okay? Should we open or close? Also a big deal, one of the topics that we're talking about tonight. So I wanna point out to you that a lot of these issues hinge on a particular thing, and that is the degree that COVID-19 is perceived as a, as a threat. So a lot of how much we're gonna open or close, how much we're gonna wear masks or not, hinges upon this issue, not all of it, but some of it. And there is a political divide in this country it's not the only divide, but it's a political divide between liberals and conservatives. Liberals, our own data suggests this, uh, Gallup data suggests this, survey data suggests liberals perceive that COVID-19 is more threatening than conservatives do. So in our brief time together tonight, I'm going to talk about why that is. Why is the country divided over COVID-19? What's going on with that? And then we're gonna discuss some work about how we can, all of us here tonight, what we can do to help bridge that political, what research suggests we can do to help bridge the political divides. Okay. Now, as a researcher, my point of entry into this as a cultural and political researcher was the following. Some of our own research and a lot of other research suggests in my field of social and political psychology that conservatives ought to be more sensitive to threat. So that's the party line for years. Conservatives are very sensitive to threat. They're especially sensitive to disease threat. So as a researcher, that was really curious to me because conservatives seem less worried than liberals about this particular disease. And so we were just curious why that was. So we investigated two possibilities in three studies that I'm gonna tell you about very briefly. So one of those possibilities was maybe liberals are actually experiencing more negative effects of the disease. So in reality, and that's accounting for the divide. So maybe if the original epicenter had been Houston, a more conservative area, instead of a more liberal New York, then the roles would have been reversed. That was one possibility we looked at. We also looked at maybe both groups are viewing this disease through their own desired political outcomes that pre-existed prior to the disease. So maybe conservatives and liberals are motivated to want different political outcomes. And COVID's perceived threat level differentially influences those outcomes. So we looked at those two possibilities in a set of three studies. So in those studies, we asked participants about whether they were conservative or liberal. We asked them a questionnaire concerning how threatening they thought the disease was, their direct experiences with COVID, whether or not they'd been directly impacted by it, whether they knew people that had it, whether they had had it, and a set of questions about what they actually wanted from a political outcome point of view. And what we were interested in primarily was, could we explain why political ideology predicted perceived threat. Why are conservatives viewing the disease as less threatening, liberals viewing it as more threatening? So that was the primary question. And we ran modern mediation analysis. I'm not gonna, for time's sake, go into detail about that, but the basic gist of it is these analyses, what I'm gonna show you, 
uh, the, so higher scores on this indirect effect I'm going to show you mean that that particular variable is accounting for more of the percentage of why conservatives view the disease as more threatening on average and liberals view it as less threatening. So, so higher scores mean it's accounting for more of that relationship. What we found was, quite frankly, I was expecting roughly equal effects, I think, across both those things. But what we found was not that at all. What we found was that overwhelmingly strong evidence that people's political motives, people's political beliefs predicted, um, or accounted for rather, the, the relationship between ideology and threat. That's indicated by those reddish bars there. I don't know what color they are from your screen. Very, very little of this effect was in our data was accounted for by their actual experiences with the disease. So translated, they suggest that the proverbial car is driving the proverbial horse. We would hope in a way that people's politics would be informed by the actual threat level they feel, but our data suggests in part it's the other way around. Their politics are informing that the threat level, they're actually causing in a sense them to feel differentially threatened by the disease. Um, so one, the, probably the biggest predictor in our data, so you say what kind of, you know, political motives are we talking about? Well, conservatives on average want less big government. And a more dangerous COVID makes government interventions more plausible feeling. And so conservatives are motivated to think, believe, that, to believe that COVID is less dangerous. They have a, a, a stake in that. On the flip side, liberals want more big government. And since more dangerous COVID makes government interventions more plausible, they are motivated to believe COVID is more dangerous. So that's a brief summary of what our data suggests. Now, all of that suggests that the pre-existing political beliefs people had are in part, not entirely, but in part driving their perceptions of this disease. The card is driving the horse, okay? So what do we do about that? So I'm gonna spend the rest of our time talking about how do, how do, we, how do we bridge that gap that we have? So one of the things our lab has been researching for years we've come to call the agreement paradox. People want, we, we feel divided. What do we do when we feel divided? We want to create agreement, right? We like agreement. It makes us feel bad that we're divided. Everybody feels terrible that we're divided. So what do we do? Well, we want press. So we're going to create pressures for agreement from the top down. So we all look like we agree. Well, those top down authoritarian pressures do in fact create artificial agreement in the short term but they can cause long-term division. So we're gonna talk about that and we're gonna talk about some of the, the consequences of that and how to bridge that gap. So the best way to illustrate the, the agreement paradox is something like this. Imagine a hypothetical, I'm not gonna do this, so don't be frightened, but imagine a hypothetical scenario that I gave you, a, I'm not, I gave an opinion on some controversial COVID-19 issue like opening up the, the country, okay. So imagine I gave a, a, a strong opinion, an extreme opinion on that and then I, one by one, we went through all of you here, and you had a moment on the screen, and what you were supposed to do was to say why my opinion was awesome. And I told you, you had to do that. And if you didn't do that, I was going to publicly shame you, and it was going to be terrible for you, okay? So imagine that. It's not going to happen, but imagine that hypothetical. Now, research suggests three things would happen. Research in my field suggests three things would happen if I did that. First, to a shockingly surprising degree, it suggests everyone would in fact comply and agree with my opinion. So we create a consensus. It'd be this great artificial consensus. Look, we all agree, Luke is really smart. His opinion is correct, okay? However, it also suggests that two other things would be going on behind the scenes. So we create this short-term agreement at the expense of long-term division. So one thing that would be happening, by the way, if I did it, is you'd be super, super mad at me privately. You might comply publicly, but privately, you'd be like, this guy's a jerk. I hate that I'm having to do this. So you'd be seething beneath the surface. Secondly, that's the more obvious thing. A little less obviously is what we call, so we call that reactance. That's a, just a psychological term for it. Secondly, is what we call informational contamination. It would contaminate this, the agreement you saw would be meaningless. In other words, you wouldn't put any stock in the fact that you saw everybody agree that Luke was great. You would leave here thinking that that consensus you witnessed was just artificial and meaningless. You would not trust it. But what if we all did agree? We'd actually cut off the potential for real agreement by doing that. So those are the consequences. Um, informational contamination can be seen by just looking at simple examples like, you know, Here's the, here's the thing, you see a poster that says diving is fun, all else being equal, you might agree with that, but there's a, there's a thing there that says no diving, so it contaminates it. You're not, I'm not sure they're serious, right? 
I'm not sure this guy's really serious about safety. That I don't know. <laughs> it contaminates his. That one doesn't need an explanation. Okay. This one, the escalator is my favorite. You have this fitness center with an escalator going to it. I'm not sure how serious they are about fitness because they built an escalator to carry people to the thing. Now, what we're doing when we're creating these pressures is in a sense, we're creating an artificial consensus, but we're, we're, we're it looks good. It looks like a fitness center, but we're building an escalator to it. We're making it and people will discount it. They don't think we're serious. So that's the consequence of reactants, informational contamination. Now, I don't have time to go through all the evidence that we've collected over how this can lead to backfiring, but we've collected evidence and, and published it in a number of, of venues that basically shows that this pressure from the top down to agree backfires often in the long term in scenario studies. So in business studies, even when the, the boss is nice, even when the intentions are good, it backfires, okay? Uh, political correctness norms, even when the intentions are good, let's all be nice, let's talk nice, it backfires in the long term, okay? Excuse me. Uh, sustainability policies, it, pressure from the top down to cause agreement works in the short term, but in the long term, it backfires. Okay, now, why do we care about this? Let's get back to the issue. What are we going to do about our political divide? Part of the reason I think we're divided is because we all tried to, we feel bad about being divided and we want to create an undivided society. So we have this tendency to create pressures, um, which, which ultimately causes more division. So what do we do? Can we get out of it? Are we, are we, are we actually just stuck in this road where there's no exit, we can't turn around and there's no U-turn, okay? Or is this really where we're at? And no, I wanna say no, we're not there, okay? I think there's a lot of hope and we're gonna finish by just talking about a couple of principles. Yes, 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 few data suggests we feel more divided than perhaps we've ever felt in a hundred years. Their data suggests this is, we, we feel terrible, okay? But we just wrote a paper, a little, a little heterodox academy blog post on why Americans feel divided, uh, are divided about COVID-19, and it got over 100,000 reads in a very short period of time, and is their most read blog post ever at Heterodox Academy, which is a major sort of outlet. And, and I'm not saying that to brag, I'm saying that to say this, look, people are, and we got a lot of positive feedback on that, and a lot of it was suggested to me that people actually want to get out of this thing. I don't, I don't think everybody just wants to scream at, across their neighbor all the time, okay, but we don't know quite what to do. So let me tell you just briefly, we're gonna talk briefly about some implications of this, okay, in the last three minutes that I have. We don't have time for implication one. We're gonna start with two. What should you do? I'm worried that people think when we say this sort of thing, oh, it's just, we're just saying be nice to each other. Well, yeah, we wanna be nice. We'll get to that in a second. We should be nice to each other. But that doesn't mean we have to stop believing what we believe. You don't, if you, so we're talking about opening and closing tonight. If you believe strongly on one of those positions, I'm not saying the solution is stop believing that thing or pretend like you don't believe that thing. No, I actually think argue it with vigor, engage with it, engage with other people is good. But what I want to say is one of the, the lens of the agreement paradox is where we kind of lost the sense that disagreement is okay somewhere. Disagreement is fun. Disagreement is healthy. Our whole system of government is based on disagreement. Just think of one issue, our legal system. What do we do? We put two opposing sides together and tell them to argue one side, the prosecution and defense, and we hope the truth comes out in the middle, right? Maybe it's actually good. We just partially needed a perspective change. Maybe it's actually good for us that people passionately disagree about these issues because they can help balance each other out. We can talk about a lot of examples in government and so forth in the American Kind of approach to things that suggests that. Okay, so uh, another implication is we, we don't actually sometimes disagree as much as, as rumor makes it out to be, and I think it's useful to, to, to realize that. We've got some examples there. I don't have time to go through them. I'm almost out of time, but look, I do want to say this. In our data, I mean, I wrote this blog post. I'm talking tonight about why we're so divided, but in our data, both liberals and conservatives actually believe that the disease is threatening, so like on our scale, the midpoint's four, both liberals and conservatives score above the midpoint on that scale. Do you see my point? My point is we're talking about how the divided is a point of degree. We focus so much on the divide, but actually there's a lot more agreement, even in our own data, than disagreement about the nature of the disease. And maybe we should focus a little bit more on that some of the time. And research in our field, not from our lab, but from other labs, it's great, suggests if you just highlight 
anything people agree on, like donuts are good, let's say, okay? Broccoli is healthy, let's say. Okay, I don't want you all going out and eat donuts all the time, even though I love donuts. So highlight something people agree on, even though it's apolitical, it can have positive impact. Now, along those lines, whether, whether you believe in guiding providence as I do, or you believe in chance, either one's fine, but the universe clearly has gifted us this instrument. And on this instrument is a really great button. There's a button. And one of the things I would suggest is how about every now and then we turn off the partisan news on both sides that's guiding us to believe that we're all divided. And every now and then instead talk to that person you mentioned and engage with that person that you disagree with in a respectful way. How about let's all do that tonight and start to do that a little bit more, okay? Finally, I'm out of time, but I did just wanna say, love people you don't agree with, okay? We have this idea that agreement, and we got this idea in our, in our culture's head, that agreement and love are equated and we need to separate those two things. Actually, agreement in my mind, agreement, love begins where agreement ends. It's easy to love someone that agrees with you and fills up your ego. It's actually harder to love someone. So you're thinking about that person as I do. I can think about people I disagree with, Maybe it can start with us tonight. Maybe this group of people can start by just reaching and bridging across those divides using these things. Okay, thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Luke. Really, really wonderful content. Great reminders on how we should be loving each other and that we actually do have more in common than maybe we think we do, especially when it concerns this crisis. So thank you so very much. Before we move on to our next speaker, I want you to take one full minute and think about any kind of questions you may have for Luke or any questions that you may have about the content that he shared with us. I'm gonna give you 60 seconds and I want you to put those questions in the Q&A function. It's right down below, right in the middle of your Zoom screen, slightly to the left. So you're just going to click on that and submit your question. If you don't have a question now, that's fine, but we're going to take the next 60 seconds for you to think about any kind of questions um, or remarks that you have about this content. I could play the Jeopardy uh, theme song, da, 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 I would, but I wasn't clever enough to think of that in advance. So we're just gonna have to do with awkward silence. I apologize. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna go ahead and move on. If you think of any questions moving forward, please, please feel free to just go ahead and drop those questions or comments in the Q&A function. You can do that at any time. It doesn't have to be now, it could be later too. So I'd like to ask another question before I introduce our next speaker. And you can please answer in the chat like you did with the first question. What are you doing now in communicating your viewpoint to people that disagree with you? Feel free to be honest. Don't be too honest, especially if you get really upset. Sometimes I, I get upset myself trying to communicate my viewpoint with people that disagree with me. But what tactics are you using now to communicate with the people in your life that you disagree with, especially on this topic? Maybe it's the person that you named before. Maybe it's your brother, your coworker, your parents, your husband. What are some tactics that you're using now to communicate your viewpoints? And you can go ahead and drop that in the chat box. Let's see. Okay, citing credible references to back up your points. St statistics, great. Data, okay, so we're very like fact-driven this evening. Great, okay. Oh, okay. So 
So it seems pointless. All right. Thank you for being honest, Jill. Appreciate that. Asking them why they believe the way they do. Asking them their why. Great. Does anyone ever try to use, <laughs> maybe this is a little too, too revealing about myself um, when I get upset, but does anyone ever try to use that person's logic against them just to try to prove their point or disprove their point and prove your point? Sometimes I do that when I get really upset. Totally. Thank you for being honest, Carol. I'm, I'm, thank you for standing with me in solidarity. I appreciate that. Um, I was feeling a little too vulnerable there for a second. Yeah, sometimes I sometimes I do that. Maybe get a little bit sarcastic on social media, especially. I've learned that sometimes I just need to hit the mute button on my social media. Uh, one parent is an attorney. Oh my goodness. Yes. <laughs> my, my father's an attorney, so I, I totally get that right on all right so thank you guys for sharing i'd love to introduce our next uh speaker beverly hallberg she is the president of district media group and a senior fellow at independent women's forum she is an expert media coach with 19 years of experience she has trained members of congress ceos and policy wonks yes they can be trained too She's a frequent contributor on both Fox News and CNN. Please welcome Beverly. Beverly, the floor is yours. Good evening. Um, I just wanna thank AF for having me here. I've actually lived in DC. July will mark tw or 20 years since I've been here. And AF was one of the first organizations that I got involved in when I first came out here. Made a lot of great friends that I still have to this day and also a lot of great contacts that are current clients. So for those of you who are part of AF, um, just know it's a great network, not just in a relational sense, but also in a career sense. So I appreciate you having me here, it's a pleasure. I wanna really pick up both on what you said, Rachel, and also Luke, what you said on the importance of connecting with people, knowing that there is a divide out there. One of the reasons why I started District Media Group is I do have a passion to be able to communicate with people who disagree. Can we help people who are on the free market, classical liberal side, help them communicate, not just to people who disagree, but also to people who are undecided and don't really know where to turn. Um, I think part of the reason why I have this passion is I grew up with a free market ideology in the heart of the San Francisco Bay Area and now live in Washington, DC. So I've been surrounded by people who disagreed with me my whole life and I love them dearly and they love me as well. So I had that added benefit of knowing individuals personally who had a very different perspective on government and on freedoms, um, things like free speech. And yet when you get to know them, you realize we have a whole lot more in common that we realize that just has to deal with how we should treat each other as neighbors. One of the benefits during this time um, during the coronavirus. For me, I live in Washington, D.C. as I've met more neighbors than I ever have before um, because we're outside doing our yards, speaking to each other a little bit more because all the tourists are gone unless you are a, a person residing in D.C. Um, you're not here right now and so it's been a, a nice time from that sense. So a lot of this is changing your perspective and, and Luke, what you were saying about the remote, I want to ask all of you this question. You don't have to respond, but you mentioned you have held up or you had that graphic of a remote and I don't know how many people feel right now that their anxiety goes up when they're watching TV versus when they shut it off and I've done that own experiment with myself where I do follow the news for a living so I have to to stay in, in touch with it but when it's the weekend if I turn it off what is my anxiety level over COVID-19 and it changes. And that's because we do have to keep in mind a lot of the information that people are getting is designed to keep them to want to watch more. So we are talking about businesses that are making money. And I do think um, a lot of the networks are thriving on the polarization we do see now more than ever before. So we have to separate ourselves from that if you really do want to get to the point of, of getting into whether or not you want to change people's minds, you want to connect. And I want to give you some tips today to think about how you do this. These are tips that I give my clients when they are dealing with Q&A at public 
public speeches or when I'm preparing them for media interviews on really tough topics, what are their techniques to be able to diffuse hostility, be able to connect and be able to very succinctly and effectively talk about the points that you think are important. Um, I want to start with one thing that I have heard repeatedly when I'm working with a client ever since Donald Trump was elected. One of the questions I like to ask people when we start is, how can I help them? What are they trying to achieve? What are they looking for in this training? And I've heard more often than I would like this, what can you train me to speak like Donald Trump? And I promptly say, I'm happy to give you your money back because I train people to do something different. It's actually the opposite. I'm not talking about his policies. I'm not talking about anything outside of his communication style. We are in a very hard time because his style of communication did win for him. So that's, that's the response I often get, but it's like, but it worked. And I just like to throw this out there, which is, it did work for him in a very specific moment in time and also because it was authentic to him. People are looking for authenticity. He was already known for firing people on TV. I will give this to him. He is being himself. And so people believed it. But when people try to implement that style of communication, you can ask Marco Rubio about that when he tried to do it on the campaign trail, it backfired on him when he tried to use the same tactics as Donald Trump. Even Nancy Pelosi calling him morbidly obese or Joe Biden coming up with the nickname President Tweety. In my opinion, it doesn't work for them to use his same tactics because I only think the tactics work for him. Um, and working for him, once again, I, I don't think in the long run it's the most effective thing, but it does work in the short run for, for the base that really supports him. So I just throw that out there for the disclaimer that I do think the way that he communicates works for him, at least in the short term, at least with a base, and because many people in this country, me included, feel that our rights have been trampled on. And so sometimes, even though we want to agree with the people that we have in our lives, I think a lot of people are scared about the direction of freedoms in our country. So I do see that we're more polarized than ever before. Coronavirus has then added this new layer to it. One thing I find really fascinating about this is it's a new issue that we've never dealt with before. So it's brand new and it touches us in so many different ways in economic ways and health ways, of course. And that's where we're seeing things battled out. So I wanna talk through those tips. The first thing everybody has to consider when they think about communicating their point is first of all, what are you trying to accomplish? What are you trying to achieve? So I don't know how many of you are on Twitter. I'm assuming the majority of you are. If you look on Twitter, it's not the most kind place. Um, and people are rewarded with followers and retweets when they say very provocative things. So you have to ask yourself, what is it that you are trying to achieve? Are you trying to make a name for yourself with people who support you? Are you trying to be purposely very provocative so you get as many retweets as possible? I'm here to say that will get you more retweets and that will get you more likes. So what's your goal? Is your goal to do that? Or is your goal to actually be able to move forward with talking about a policy issue or a perspective that you have that can actually reach the average person. I think it is a good thing for your followers to not get how many followers you have to actually be a slow, steady stream, <laughs> because it probably means the people that you did get are going to stay. They're going to stay and they're not there just because you're saying the most provocative things. Now, there are places and times to be provocative, and I think that's fine, but you have to ask yourself those questions. And so let's say one on one conversations with people. I know every every Thanksgiving, there's the articles, too many articles on this that come out about the dining room table thanks Thanksgiving table. If we do have Thanksgiving this year and can meet with family and friends, I think we're going to have even more interesting conversations. Um, how do you engage with people in your life, family, friends, neighbors, coworkers, um, and knowing this, and I think this is an important thing to keep in mind, there are times to not engage. It is okay to not engage in conversation if you don't think it's going to be an honest debate. Um, if you think it's actually going to ruin your relationship. For example, I have one friend who 
she gets very personal with her attacks on <laughs> towards me with her ideology and i know i can be very sensitive about it and so we just choose to not talk about that and that's fine i have another friend we, we differ very much but we can have honest conversations and it doesn't get personal and so i i've even had with that one friend i have to choose to not engage because i know her style of debate is actually not conducive to us seeing if there is agreement. Um, so you have to make those decisions on who you want to engage in, who you want to talk to. I do think that the polarization we see these days makes us feel sometimes like that we shouldn't speak up. I always think it's interesting if you look at polling and the questions people are willing to answer or willing to be honest at depends on whether or not they're, they fear they're going to be judged for their opinion. So Luke, with what you were saying, I hope we can get to a point where people can disagree and that's deemed okay. I'm worried about college campuses and disagreement not being allowed anymore. Disagreement is so important important and it's important to engage in it, but it does take a little bit of bravery um, to be able to, to bring this up. But I do think it's worth it. I think it's worth it to talk to the people in our lives about issues and also to get above the political back and forth that we hear that is really based on business and making money. And I have no problem with businesses making money, but they do have a business model. So getting away from that a little bit. So if you decide to engage and you realize the point of engaging is to actually try to move the needle in some way, just a little bit. The first thing that I recommend that you do is try to find, try to connect with a place you can agree. Can you find common ground first? Can you agree on something before you show where you disagree? So that's one of my favorite tactics to give to clients or even use myself in a media interview is, I'll give you an example even outside of COVID-19, Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act. One of my starting statements, if the question is about that when it was first, when Obamacare first came out is, we can all agree our current healthcare system is not meeting the needs of everyone. Like, let's just agree on that. We have some flaws in the system that we need to look at. The question is, what do we do? So if you can find agreement, so for example, depending on where you are on reopening or things staying closed, I, I lean towards a small business owner. I think we can reopen safely. We should trust people to do so, and depending on the area and how bad the virus is in different areas. At least start with, we have to take people's health seriously because this is a very dire virus for the vulnerable populations. Everything that we do economically has to first of all consider the people who we want to protect their lives. Um, so you start with that before you get into your perspective. I had a very friendly um, back and forth on Twitter today. We're friends with somebody who takes a different, well, it sounded like took a different perspective than me on masks, but because we found common ground, we actually agreed. So she's very much, you need to wear masks all the time. And she, she has, um, a, a, a autoimmune disease. So there's a personal reason why she's very fearful about going out. And I started by saying, I completely agree with you when we're around people, when we go into stores, we want to do everything that we can to protect people. Um, for example, people in your situation. And then I went into my perspective, which is, but I think it depends on whether or not we're around people people running, you know, then give give the examples of where I think we need to realize people are properly social distancing, then there should be the allowance to not judge somebody for not wearing a mask if they're taking precautions in those situations. So she's like, oh, I totally agree with that. I don't think people need to wear them all the time. But the way we are going to hear arguments are going to be from a very binary perspective. It's either all one way or all another way. And what you want to do is get more to that middle because that's where most people agree <laughs> it's that middle area and so you start by diffusing any potential hostility by showing hey we agree on this outcome here's the goal that we're trying to achieve then you get into how do we get there so I want to get to that second part. So show that show that common ground to start with. Oh, one other thing on this you may want to think about too is if you ever are in a discussion and somebody talks about a victim, whether hypothetical or a real victim, somebody has died, somebody is negatively impacted by something, 
the way our brains work is to first start with let me lay out my argument and then come back around to that person that they mentioned you have to start with showing acknowledgement of that individual either saying it's horrific what they're going through no doubt that's difficult whatever you need to say you need to show compassion i call it showing emotion to emotion if there is an emotional argument that somebody is making try to show emotion and connection because if you sound like you don't care about people people aren't going to listen to you you have to start with caring and then bring up the point so when you're bringing up your point what is it that you do so i think we have uh, online today probably a lot of really intelligent people that could spend a lot of time talking about everything from regulations to eminent domain to occupational licensing you could give me some detailed answers to these the more that you know about an issue the harder it is for you to actually win your argument because you have so many rabbit trails you can go down. Because in your mind, you're thinking, if I could just fully educate people, share with them everything that I know about this issue, they'd agree with me, like they would agree. Not necessarily. Sometimes you just inundate them with so much information, they just zone out. And if you haven't started with the connecting portion first, connecting on common ground or connecting with emotion, you've lost them because it sounds like it's just facts. So if you have a tendency to give a list to people, my example is to hone in on one argument and do this. Is there an example that you can use? Can you attach one data point as proof to that example? So you can inundate people with far too many numbers. That is not your goal. <laughs> your goal isn't to show them how smart you are. But I think a data point can prove, can prove the case. But I find just giving real life examples are really, really important when you're explaining your issue. And along those lines, personal anecdotes go a long way. So if there's a reason why you personally have a strong um, position on this, you should bring that up. So I, I talk often about being a small business owner with only three full-time employees. So even if I'm talking about COVID-19 and reopening, I always mention that I'm somebody who is a small business owner who has, who has had to decrease or our business has decreased quite a bit because of this. So my perspective is coming from somebody who's experiencing this. While somebody else who has health concerns can talk about this from their perspective of health. So personal anecdotes work as well, but when you're thinking about your argument, try to bring it to life with an example or an illustration or an anecdote and try to change those anecdotes based on who you're speaking to. So this is where you want to know your audience. Who are you speaking to and what is going to be the most compelling case? Your most compelling case talking to somebody in a nursing home is going to be different than somebody who's partying at the beach in Florida or Texas, <laughs> what may actually connect with them on what wins. It doesn't mean that you're ever not saying things you don't believe. You're just tailoring it to the audience there. And then last thing I just wanna wrap up with is it's important that you have a good delivery. So don't lose your cool. If you lose your cool and get angry, you're not gonna get anywhere. If you're back and forth with somebody is getting pretty hostile, as I was saying earlier, it's okay to, stop, um, not engage if you know that this is a possibility. Is this a is this something that could lead to a good outcome or not? But keep your cool, make eye contact with people, look at them, ask questions. Like this isn't just about you speaking your mind. Um, this is also listening. And I find one of the, the best things I can encourage you to do is if you do want to debate these issues, listen to what people who disagree with you say. So I do watch all the networks and hear all the arguments. And when I'm working with clients, they often can't guess what a host would ask them on a show because they're only self-selecting what they want to watch. And that's, I like that we have the option to self-select what we want to watch, but that's what algorithms and social media and also our, our cable networks do is we choose what we like to hear. And so that means we often don't know always what the arguments are the other side or what they're hearing. What is it that they're being told? So do as much as you can on reading people who disagree with you, watching people who disagree with you, um, hearing what they have to say, because you will probably, first of all, have a little bit more compassion at times about where they're coming from. 
based on the information they have. And you will also be more prepared to be able to meet that challenge. And the last thing I just wanna say is practice is important. If you wanna do this well, this is not an easy thing. Um, it's really easy to be long-winded and just speak off the top of your head. It's really hard to be purposeful and connect. There's a reason why I have a business and have had it for quite a while. And that's because people need to practice and nobody, people rarely practice on their own. And I come in and take them through tough questions and we practice and record and play it back because communication is a really important tool if you want to get your ideas out there, but you have to communicate well. So that's it. Thank you so much, Beverly. Solid advice. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, I'm going to give us another 60 seconds to think through some questions that you might have for Beverly or might have on the topic of communication. Maybe there's something you didn't understand well. Maybe you have a different perspective. So 60 seconds. Again, I wish I had the Jeopardy uh, theme song for you, but I don't. We're going to go with awkward silence again. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and go on mute and give you 60 seconds to drop your questions in the Q&A function. Again, it's right in the middle of Zoom, slightly to the left of center. You can also ask questions anonymously. If there's something that you want to ask and you don't want to have your name attached to it, you can also do this in the function. I'm going to give about another 10 seconds. And even when this 10 seconds is over, feel free to just continue to ask questions. You can ask more than one question. That's OK, too. Okay, so as I mentioned before, if you think of a question, feel free to go ahead and pop it in the Q&A feature. I would like to go ahead and move to announcements um, very quickly. Next week, we have another AF event, same bat day, same bat time, Wednesday of next week, the 27th at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That's gonna be discussing about the appropriate role of government during this crisis and ways that we can hold government accountable. The event is called Eternal Vigilance, where the government might overstep its bounds during reopening. So be tuned in for that. You should get a notification in your inbox. So you can uh, register for that, send it to friends and family if that's a topic that interests you. And, and again, you can go to americasfuture.org and view us on Facebook or Instagram. If you're interested in any of the other chapter events that happen on a monthly basis, they're gonna be covering topics on reopening, um, other local issues, training on communication, on ways to um, manage your finances, all different kinds of topics. So stay tuned in for that. Um, Beverly, do you have anything that you would like, uh, any announcements or information that you would like to impart to our audience? Just wanted to let them know that if they have any interest in training, either for public speaking or media training, District Media Group does offer that. So I'll type in the chat box just where they can find us online and also my email and where they can find me on Twitter if they have any interest. Great. Thanks, Beverly. And uh, Luke, is there any information that you would like to leave with our audience or any announcements that you would like to make? Um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm going to just put in some if anybody's interested in following up, I've done some recent interviews on these topics in various places. And also they can go to our ResearchGate page and get some of the papers that I mentioned or to Google Scholar. So I'm just gonna plug that in in case anybody wants to follow up. Perfect, wonderful. And in fact, guys, I found uh, Luke by reading that wonderful article that he wrote um, on Hector 
I can I can't pronounce it. Luke, can you pronounce the Sorry. I'm sorry. I think our Zoom was acting up. Can you say the blog again or maybe type it? Uh, Heterodox <laughs> Academy is the name of the blog. Sorry. Yeah. It, it Heterodox is it's interesting. It's actually a group of academics who are trying to bridge political divides. So if you're curious about that kind of thing, um, it's, it's a good place to go. Our field is dominated by liberals. Um, social psychology is overwhelmingly liberal and heterodox is in some sense a, an attempt to try to, amongst other things, to try to balance the scale a little bit um, to, to make, to, to bridge divides across groups. So Wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. It really is a great place to go, guys, to find wonderful articles and wonderful authors and scientists like Luke. Um, so, all right. Oh, I don't know why I just tried to mute myself. That was weird. So we're going to go ahead and move to Q&A. Again, feel free if a question or a comment pops in your head, go ahead and drop it in that Q&A section. Um, Okay, so we're going to go with a uh, first question from Jay, and I believe this is for Luke. Um, answer it if, if you can. Uh, what slash whom do you think is driving the divide? Example, what or who benefits from the ideological divide? Yeah, that, that is a great question, um, Jay. And I, I don't know the answer for sure, but I will tell you a little bit about whatever our own, our own data suggests that on both sides, the people that are more likely to be driving it are authoritarians. So we've got data on left-wing authoritarians and right-wing authoritarians. By the way, left-wing authoritarianism, which our lab studies a lot, is a controversial issue in the field. We just had a big debate with John Joe's lab at SPSP about it. So I'm not trying to present it as if it's a fact, but from my point of view, we have data that suggests that divisive behaviors on both sides are more likely to be the result of authoritarian persons on both sides. So those people who are especially likely to be dogmatic, especially likely, and I, and I think those people often are represented in, in the, not always, I, I don't want to I'm not trying to say don't ever watch the news, okay? Not not all a lot of news people are awesome, and I've had great interactions with many of them. So I don't I don't mean to just trash the news, but a lot of times I think that's what's represented on the news, and a lot of times I think that. So to answer the question about who benefits, I don't. I mean, I can give speculation on that, but I, I don't know. That's a little beyond my purview. But I can say that that from our data, the people more likely to be divisive more likely to engage in divisive behaviors on both right and the left are typically dogmatic authoritarians. And they're not the majority of people on either side. The majority of people are not authoritarian. The majority of left-wingers are not authoritarian. majority of right-wingers are not authoritarian. So, but they're the people I think getting a lot of the headlines, <laughs> just how it feels to me anyway. Uh, I also think, go back to the sort of larger point about Twitter, I also think part of it has been exacerbated. I mean, this is just speculation, but part of it seems to me clearly exacerbated by our current media mechanisms. Look, there's good and bad to Twitter. I, I, I don't, I don't want to come off as too anti-Twitter, although everybody that knows me know, knows I'm not a fan. I'm a complexity researcher. I study the integrative complexity, how, how complex things are. And we did a study, believe it or not, on how complex, the, how complex tweets are. And the average person is about at a two on our scale of one to seven. And the average tweet is at 1.07. That's really low, by the way, in case you're wondering. So that's like the bottom almost no complexity. So I'm not a huge fan of it. And I, and I, I sort of had the same response as, as Beverly did. I thought her talk about her, her comments on that were, were spot on. I was asked on a podcast the other day, like, how much hope do you feel? And I said, well, it depends on whether I'm reading Twitter or talking to my neighbor. You know, if I'm talking to my neighbor, I feel great. If I'm talking to my family, I, I feel great, even though we disagree a lot. If I'm talking to my colleagues, I feel great. If I'm talking to my people in my church, I feel great most of the time, you know. And like Beverly, I mean, I'm a liberal who's religious. So I'm, I'm, I'm in an academic environment where I'm a huge minority because I'm religious and most of them are not. And then I go to my evangelical church and I'm liberal and most of them are not. So I like Beverly, I've kind of grown up being used to dealing with people that disagree with me on multiple fronts. And in those fronts, I get, 
I've been treated like a prince in academia. I get along fine with people. I've been treated well in my church. I get along fine with people. But on Twitter, I get frightened when I, you know, when I see, I feel like I'm being lambasted from a distance all the time. I'm not, Twitter has great uses. And part of me likes the direct access part of it. You know, let's just get straight to what the people think. That's great. It's, it's populism. It's democracy. I'm a fan of that in many ways. But I do think it, to the larger point of Jay, but I did remember Jay's question. Okay. To the larger point about Jay's great question, I think that's partially exacerbated the speed of, of and people, and a lot of research in my field says when people can be anonymous or they can hide a bit behind what they say, it's different when you have to talk face to face to a live human being and you have to live with their facial expressions and their, and you know, when you talk to your actual neighbor or family and a fa it's different. So part of it, I think has been exacerbated by that. Sorry, I took up too much time there. Apologies. How dare you, sir? No, it's okay. Great, great information. Thank you so much for sharing that. I actually had a friend once tell me that Twitter's just the same 3% of people talking to themselves and others. Like they're just going around in, in circles. Um, but I, I don't know how accurate that, that uh, The latest study that I heard is 5% of the country is on Twitter. So it's not a large amount. Um, every reporter is on Twitter. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, not, not, not many people are on Twitter. And most academics are also on Twitter for the record. Uh -huh. So yeah. Right on. Okay. So we have, oh, we don't have much time left. Um, let's see if we can do one more question. Um, all right. I believe this is for Beverly. Um, is there a difference between how one might engage or whether you should engage at all with someone who holds a different opinion, but which you can see some logic to? Example, should you wear a mask or not? Versus engaging with someone who holds a different viewpoint that is well outside the realm of reason. For example, flat earthers. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. And I just kind of rounding out the discussion on Twitter, one of the things I find is that anonymity destroyed civility. So we have lost a lot of civility because there isn't that initial response of having to see someone and see how they interact. I think um, part of the reason we are where we are as far as so being so divided is that we were able to separate ourselves from each other and not see the person that we were talking about. Um, and that's where the authoritarian sides, it's they wanna make a decision for everybody not knowing who you are. And I think it's the name calling. If you're on one side, you're not allowed to have that perspective and vice versa. We haven't been allowed to have our opinions and then the debates don't go well from there. So I think there's a lot wrapped up in that. But, but going to this question, if somebody, I do find that if, if somebody is willing to have that discussion with you, wants to talk through it, if there is something that you can do to make them feel more comfortable to show that you care about them as a person, then do it. So if wearing a mask, because that's very important to them, that shows them respect, I would do that. So is there a way for you to be respectful towards them um, to state your case? So even though I am a I am not a wear a mask all the time type of person. I do take offense to people who out of this, like this bravery, this badge of honor, like I will never wear a mask because, and that's like what they want to stake their claim on. That's not going to move anyone. <laughs> um, so if wearing a mask helps the conversation you have with a person, even if you don't think that that mask needed to happen, that is going to be beneficial. I, I did get into a conversation with someone on Twitter I asked this question about a mask. I said, well, look, we have more people who are getting the antibody tests. If somebody knows they've had it before and it, the research holds up that you can't get it again and you can't spread it, should that person wear a mask? I was really curious what, what she said about that. If you know, there's no harm that you could cause. And she said, well, for the sake of solidarity, they should. Now, I disagree with that statement for a variety of reasons. But in order to have a conversation with somebody about that, I wouldn't have any issue with wearing a mask to have that conversation. Now, somebody completely outside of the realm of possibility, you may just not want to engage. Now, if this is a family member or a friend that's going to be in your life, that's fine. Just going back to Twitter, I don't retweet accounts where I don't think it's a, an account that's honest about their perspective. 
So even who I retweet, even I follow people who I think are kind of in the very crazy camp <laughs> um, to see what they're saying, but I'm not going to retweet um, something that I'm like, look, we, we can't even meet halfway on this unless it's somebody that I know. If it's somebody I know, then there's a different conversation that can be had. Great, thank you so much, Beverly. And I, I see that uh, several of you have additional questions. Um, please feel free to look at the resources and the contact information for Luke and Beverly in the chat and feel free to contact them, tweet at them if, if you like, or, or email them um, if you want answers to those questions. We're gonna be respectful of everyone's time and we're gonna end here. Um, but please feel free to reach out to them. I know that there is, uh, Lou, there is interest in that blog post that uh, you and I both referenced. I don't know if you put the link over there, but um, I do believe they should be able to get to your that blog post through the links that you have provided. Is that correct? Wonderful, okay, great. Yeah, it's kind of, what I posted over there looks like an absolute mess and I'm sorry for that. I feel very self-conscious about it. It did not look like I was anticipating. <laughs> so I'm gonna just post the link to that blog and it's, I'm, I'm just gonna put that in the chat. Maybe it'll look better. There it goes, okay. So apologies for that. No worries, it happens. I'm new at chat posting, so. <laughs> right on, it's, it's all good. Um, well, thank you all for coming and thank you, Lou. Thank you, Beverly, so much for, for taking time out of your uh, Wednesday evening, your hump day evening, and joining us for this timely topic. I learned a lot. I don't know about our other attendees, but I learned a whole lot. I think you all did too. Again, please feel free to look up Luke and Beverly on social media, email them, follow their work. They're both wonderful people. Can't say enough good things about them. And I hope you all have a great evening. Stay safe. Thank you all, this is great.